Mr. Jack O'Holler, and thank you very much for coming on to the boxingbar.com and welcome, sir. My pleasure. Uh, where were you born and raised, Jack? I was born in uh, in, in Philadelphia. What was it like being raised there in Philadelphia? It was uh, not bad at that time, in that, in that period. But then they built the Walt Whitman Bridge, and everybody fled into South Jersey. So when I was like 16 years old, we moved over to the Jersey built a house and moved to Belmar, New Jersey, which is on the Black Horse Pike. And I graduated high school in uh, running me New Jersey. What was your childhood like? It was quite normal. I have a brother and three sisters. And, uh, no, it was, it was, you know, I went to high school, I played all sports in high school, Bas- basketball, football, track. I was a decent student. I was all state, uh, football and broke records in track and the discus. And, um, so I was a pretty good athlete. I read somewhere that your father was Albert Anastasia, who was connected to the mobs and all that. How did you get to know that? Well, I only met him once. Um, I was raised by uh, my mother and uh, stepfather, and I was like a love child from World War II, you know. Albert, uh, when they were trying to put him in jail, he was in the Army in, uh, in uh, Indian Gap, Pennsylvania, which he never spent any time. He was always down in Philadelphia. And uh, he and my mother got together, and I was a product of 1943. Um, and he put somebody around me that, that looked after me when I was raising up, and uh, I didn't know that much about anything until uh, I was 14 when uh, he came to watch me play football. And I met him, and uh, I was supposed to go up to New York to sit down with him, and uh, the following week he got assassinated. And they assassinated him because he wouldn't go in the drug business. And the Anastasia family became the Gambino family. Carlo Gambino was his underboss. Albert was uh, Albert was a very powerful man. But he just, like in The Godfather, when Brando wouldn't refuse to do the drug business, Albert did the same thing. And he controlled all the docs in America. And he said, you know, we didn't sign up for this. Not with our, this isn't our gig. And it was sad because by the assassination, they all made knew they made a mistake afterwards because he was the glue that held everything together. He ran a company called Murder Incorporated, and they um, and things changed and they they got into drug business and stuff like that and started shooting each other and you know a lot of changes in in a lot of, over the last sixty years. You know, obviously, I'm sure you would have loved to have known him more and got to know. Well, him better, I would have. So. He left me left me 256 pages of things that were there and where to come. And then I was taken care of by Meyer Lansky and Frank Costello and a couple other people. And I just raised out my life, and you know, and I, uh, until I got out of high school and I was uh, going to go to college. And I, I watched in Kentucky. I was down there for a while. And then I left them going to play pro ball. And in, in that period of time, you couldn't play pro ball unless your class graduated college. So we played in a in the uh, Eastern Conference League that was like a farm team for football teams for people like that. They, they left school early and had to wait for their class to graduate. For so they played in this league, and then we went back up when it was time for me to go and play at the Jets. They had picked me up right away, and I played under their tutelage. And uh, a lot of friends of mine were playing in Philadelphia, and I said, you know, I'd like to go down and play down in Philly to Eubank. He said, well, you got a home here. So but I went down to Philly, a lot of friends were playing, and then the team was sold to a guy called Jerry Wallman, and he hired a coach called Joe Kuharik, and in three months' time, I watched this guy trade a championship football team away. Sonny Jurgensen and Tommy McDonald were traded to Washington for Norman Sneed, and Irv Cross and uh, Maxie Bourne would trade. I mean, the, the, it's incredible. So one day I come out of the meeting, he walked right by us. Timmy Brown and I was a running back, and I told him to take the team and stick it, and Timmy said, trade me while you're at it. And some friends of mine in Philadelphia were in the boxing world, and Sam Margolis had Sonny Liston and a few other people, and partner was Blinky Palermo, and I guess uh, Ali had just won the title, and I said, I could beat that guy. Next thing I know, I wind up in the gym. I couldn't box amateur because I was a professional for, because of football. And so I just went straight into the pros and boxed for nine years. And I uh, got a client, I was claimed in three boxing hall of fames and 
California heavyweight champion and New England heavyweight champion and gave me a, a reason to travel all around the world. Sorry, and I think Blake Palermo was a trip. But he was in jail when I was fighting. And he had, 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 they got in trouble over a boxing match. He and Frankie Carbo. The, uh, I mean, if Carbo had been out, I'd have been champion of the world. But I didn't. Uh, boxing was like a day job, something to keep law and order away from me. And I took care of my business at night and boxed during the day. And when I was 16 and 0, they found out I had a disease called acromegalia, which is a tumor of the pituitary gland, and I wasn't supposed to ever box again. And I said, "That's bull," and I just kept on going. And some days I probably shouldn't have got in the ring, and didn't train as diligently for some things as I should have, but. I had a tremendous talent, so I got away with it for a period of time. And I fought some contenders and beat them and lost some fights and won some, won a lot of fights. And I had uh, beat some pretty good fighters, Al Blue Lewis and Cleveland Williams and Terry Daniels and Danny McElhinney and a whole host of people that were contenders that are, so it made me a ranked fighter for several years. And, and then when uh, I had the operation for the acromegaly, my whole system changed drastically so i went from boxing into the movie business which they tried to get me into while i was boxing and i thought i was going to fight ali so i kept saying no and ali and i were signed four times to fight this never happened blink and palermo and uh, frankie carbo they had so much influence in boxing back during the time they that controlled were, it, it they exactly, controlled boxing. exactly um like you brought up sunny liston and you know that's how he came up as well, um, because because of your 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 dad's connection with uh, you know all that was that like an influence on how you got into boxing. Well, it was. I mean, it didn't hurt. You know, uh, they were, Sam Margolis was my manager, and he was uh, head of the Jewish people in Philadelphia, and partners with Blinky. Blinky, unfortunately, uh, was, was in jail at the time and with Carbo and. Uh, they were over the Saxon fight and something to do with the claim they fixed the fight or something. You know. But they, so I, you know, I, but I just went on and on and did what I did. I should have been, should have listened and went to camp and stuff like that, but I never did. I'd take fights on a week's notice and, and beat some pretty good fighters. And, and I was doing union business and stuff in my father's world at the same time. I was very much involved with some people. And, but I just, uh, like I said, I used boxing like a day job. I, I abused a, a great talent that I had, and, and I'm sorry for doing it. And, you know, when I got done boxing and went into the film business, I took a young kid, Frankie Lyles, and I made him super middleweight champ of the world and started Freddie Roach. Freddie Roach worked Frankie's corner with me, and, and I trained Frankie and showed Freddie a lot of things, and Freddie was a pretty good trainer and turned out to be a hell of a trainer. One of the best in the business today. I remember Frankie Lyles, and he did have a very good career during the time when I first started. You know, really getting into boxing and watching it. Frankie was Frankie was uh, he was boring as a southpaw, and they kicked him out of the Crunk Gym because he was undefeated as southpaw and boring. And they sent him out to uh, the Goosens. I I was working out every day. I always went to the gym. Yeah, well, he's, he was working out in the gym, and I saw him work out one day, and I took him aside and had a conversation with him. And I told him if he did everything I told him to do, I'd make him champion of the world in six months, and I did it. And he beat everybody right down the list. He went right down to the top, top seven super middleweights in the world. He beat them all. Michael Nunn, everybody. Actually, I was just out of sending messages with Michael Nunn just a little bit ago. We were uh, uh, talking about something in boxing. Michael's a good friend of mine. I like Michael. Uh, Michael's a good kid. Yeah, yeah. He's a great kid. What do you remember about boxing in your childhood? I mean, about watching it or being around it? or My mother's stepfather, Pete Healy, was a bare-knuckle fighter from South Philadelphia and quite successful in the streets. And, and he was a pretty good pretty good fighter. And he taught me a lot when I was younger. And, uh, I boxed pal a little bit, you know, but I, I learned how to fight. Uh, as a very young age, which gave me a lot of credibility in the street, <laughs> you know. Oh, I, bet. I never followed boxing. I followed it, you know, and then, like I said, when Ali won the title, I told this guy, I said, I, I can beat that guy. 
he put me in the gym and I went from, I was playing ball at 280. So I went from 280 down to 230 and my career launched. I what was did, 16, first 16 fights, I was 16 and 0. What did uh, uh, Frankie uh, Carbo and Palermo think of, um, what did they think of Jake Lombardo after he did what he did and, and go to court? Well, I knew Jake. Jake had a bar down in Atlantic City. And he was uh, Jake was a good guy. He was a tough, tough guy where he could fight. But they told him that he had to give up a fight to win to fight for the title, and that really irked him. And it was it was in, in his makeup, but he did it, you know. And he got the Robinson fight. And Jake Jake was a pretty good fighter, good well, guy. Well, he was a terrific fighter, and he fought uh, uh, Sugar Ray Robinson six times. Uh, great fights. I know. Great, great fights. And what do you remember about boxing? Like, who were your your heroes in, in boxing, or who were the the guys that you? Well, looked Willie up to? Pep, Willie Pep was a good friend of oh mine. And Willie Willie was a great oh fighter. Oh my God, yes. Willie Pep was a Willie Pep was a hell of a fighter. In fact, he worked my corner when I knocked out Manuel Ramos in L.A. No Willie, way! I was going to ask you about that fight. Yeah, Willie was in my corner. Well, I, I went down to. Um, it was a time when I got in shape. Whenever I got in shape, people ran away from me. I went down to, uh, I had a fight in Johannesburg, South Africa. And 11 days later, I fought Ramos out in L.A. And I actually beat Jimmy Richards down there. They called it a draw because it was hometown down there. And they wanted me to stay, and I said no. So you know, he went the distance with me, and so they called the fight a draw, which was bull. And I got on a plane, went home, then went out to L.A. And uh, I remember when I... I get out to L.A., the promoter said, my God, you're in great shape. I said, well, aren't you supposed to be in shape when you come out here to fight? <laughs> I said, I'm going to knock this bum out. He said, oh, no, God, you can't do it. They were getting ready to make Ramos and Ali for the title. And, uh, and he was very popular in L.A., not- but but I, I want to get back to that in a bit. On September 22nd, 1966, he made your pro debut there in Reading, uh, Pennsylvania. What do you? What did you yeah, feel? Knocked the guy out in ninety seconds. So, well, what did you feel like uh, before coming out the drapes at night? You know, what was it like in the dressing room for you? Were you nervous? Were you scared? What was it like for you? No, back there? I wasn't nervous at all. In fact, I was looking forward to it. I was in great shape. I had a great old time trainer, Gene Johnson. I was I was in great shape. Gene Johnson had three hundred and twenty fights. He worked for Sam Margolis. He ran in the kitchen in Sam's restaurant, and he was uh, he taught me a lot. He really, really, really schooled me in boxing. And I could move, and I was big, and I was fast, and I had fast hands. And What was that, fir- what was that first fight like against uh, Joe Pindo there uh, in your backyard there? Um... It was over too quick. <laughs> it didn't last very long. <laughs> and... <laughs> and all I remember is we went back down in the dressing room, and Pinto was screaming to people, you told me this guy couldn't fight, and I split the whole side of his head open. <laughs> he said, you said he couldn't fight, look what he did to me. Oh, my God. I, I had my first several fights in Philly, and then I went to Boston because we got into some trouble in the street, and they shipped me up to Boston to keep me out of trouble, and I never lost a fight in Massachusetts. And you fought your first several uh, first fights there in Philadelphia and in the Boston area. Um, in your 10th fight, you fought... Yeah, machine in the garden at, at the garden there in uh in Madison Square Garden and you know the biggest arena in, in the world. How did it feel being there? You know, being so young and only ten fights in, and you're fighting there at Madison Square uh, Garden. What was that like? I, I I was always very relaxed in the ring. I never I didn't get any. I mean, I, I used to play football in front of sixty thousand people, so you know, it was a, crowds never bothered me or nothing. I just focused on what I had to do. No, Tommy Sheehan was a nice kid. He, he, you know, we went to limit. I think it was a four round or six round. I forget. Uh, and he was a tough kid from Scranton, Pennsylvania. Yeah, tough and I beat kid. him pretty easy actually. Uh, being there, did it? Did you take a, a step back and say, "Damn, I'm in Madison Square Garden. This is where everybody wants a fight." Kind of. It was kind of neat that I, I knew a lot of, I knew a lot of people from the families in New York who came to see me fight. They couldn't believe I was fighting, and. Uh, so it was good, you know. I should have knocked them out, actually, but I I enjoyed boxing. So if I was beating you easily, I just carried it. I just went round by round, and it didn't bother me. Enough. I enjoyed the I enjoyed the art, I enjoyed learning, and then every fight I did, I learned. In nineteen sixty nine, you fought twice in London. 
you know, uh, was that the first time you went there? And I know that down the line, you know, you spent a lot of time in London or lived there. I mean, uh, that was the first time I went, I went over to London and I fought Joe Bugner and, and I beat the shit out of him. In fact, in fact, it was we fought in Albert <laughs> Hall. We fought in Albert Hall and it was a, we signed to do a 10 round fight. And Mickey Duff, who was very influential over there, was his trainer and his manager. And I had him, and in the, in the eighth round, I had him. He was he was out on his feet, and all of a sudden they stopped the fight. And I said, "Like <laughs> Terry Downs was actually in my corner tonight. He jumped up, screaming up and down. He was a super. He was a middleweight champ from uh, London. He uh, he went nuts. He, what do you mean? And they they said, "No, no, it was only an eight round fight. No, it was supposed to be ten rounds." And then they took a decision of a quarter of a point. No one ever ever heard of anything like that before. Somebody winning by a quarter of a point, and the uh, newspapers the next day even printed it. Joe Bugger wins by a quarter of a point, which we thought was a kind of a farce. Did, I'd never so, heard of that. I never heard of that. I never heard that uh, something about a quarter point or half a point or anything. Yeah, like it was that. a qu- he got a quarter of a point decision. Oh wow! <laughs> so I never heard of that. And the referee, and the referee was they didn't have judges. The referee ruled the fight, and they. And his, and his name was Gibbs, the guy who was, he was a, supposedly one of the top referees over So when I fought, uh, I think it was Carl Gizzy, who was a champ of Wales, and I beat him in the, at the governor house and had the same referee. And at the end of the fight, he came up to me and said, see, we don't cheat you all the time, Jack. <laughs> oh, my God, that's crazy. And then I beat Mac Linden, who was a champ of Ireland and stuff. Oh. Um, he was a pretty good fighter. I fought him in Albert Hall as well. Later that year is when you fought Mexican uh, uh, Manuel Ramos there at the Forum in Inglewood. And yeah. I, I, I'm Mexican-American myself, and I know whoever fights a, a Mexican, it's going to be, you know, you, they're, they're going to boo you, you know, if you're not Mexican well, Manu, yourself. Manuel was a tough guy. He was, he, he yeah, oh, he, he oh, was yeah he, he was very popular, man. He was popular with the, because uh, Mexicans, you know, they didn't go up to the heavyweight division. They were always in the well, lighter weights. So yeah, yeah. you know, for, for you to, for to fight Ali. yeah, for you to fight, you know, a Mexican fighter in, in in a Mexican community, you know, what was that like? What was that fight like against Manuel Ramos? Well, I I I, not, I told him I told him before the fight I was going to knock him out. All the George people Francis was the biggest promoter. Yeah, out he, there. he was. George, no matter when I got off the plane, and he looked at me and he said, oh "My God, you're in shape." I said, "You're supposed to be in shape." I said, "Not only that, but I'm going to knock this bum out." You can't do that. He said, "You didn't come out." I said, "Listen." <laughs> Trust me, he's going out. And he was uh, he was a tough guy, though. He, he, he took, a, took a couple good shots from me, boy. And when you knock a guy out late in the rounds, you know it takes a bit to do that because everybody's warmed up, and, you know. What was the crowd like there? You know, I'm sure they were all against you. you know. <laughs> what was, did did, did, that, was did that mess with you a little bit? No, nah, it didn't bother me at all. No, nah, it didn't bother me at all. And, you know, you... Then you when, I got, when I got done fighting him... When I get done fighting him, they offered me the film The Great White Hope with James Earl Jones. It was a Jack Johnson story, and I, I turned it down. Because I thought of from the from the, from the Ramos fight, and I who, thought I was going to get you? a fight with, uh, with Ali. Who, who were you supposed to fight or be uh, in, in The Great White Hope? Were you supposed to be Jess Willard? Or? Jess Willard, yeah. Jess oh. Willard. Oh, wow. Trip out. The very next. Yeah, I told him to hire the guy from Detroit. It was, I mean, what, not to try, where was he from? Uh, Jim Beatty. Jim Beatty was a nice kid. He just retired from boxing. And I said, yeah. he's got a lot of mouth to feed. Give him a job. <laughs> and the guy said, well, this is, I was supposed to take the fight. They were, because it took me to Spain for six months. And I said, well, wait a minute. Oh, wow. I'm looking to fight. I just beat, I just knocked the number two heavyweight in the world out. And I'm looking to fight for the title. And you want me to go to Spain? And I said, well, and there's some friends of mine from the East Coast put the fight together. They're the ones that put the deal together, Raymond Patriarca from Rhode Island, just to get me off the streets. So they didn't thought I was going to get in trouble, so they, got, they wanted to get me off the streets. And Eddie Foy was scared. that He, he was running Fox. And he said, you're going to get us killed? You're supposed to do this fight. And every, I mean, this uh, this movie, it was all set up for you just to sign the contract. And I said, no, nah, I'm not going to do it. So I walked away, and Steve McQueen called me up. What the hell are you doing? I said, ah, not my time. He tried to get me to do the Thomas Crown Affair when he was in Boston. Wow. And then when I retired from boxing, they, they, they called me up 
my agent, I, I, when I was California heavyweight champion, I did a lot of commercials. And I had an agent down there, and she called me on the phone. She said, Jack, they want you to do a film, and I think you should really consider it. I had retired from boxing, and I was running construction. I had a couple of companies and looked around. And I said, you know, maybe we'll give it a shot. And uh, met the director in New York and they flew me out to California and did a screen test. And Robert Mitchum said, it's either him or I don't do the movie. And Farewell, My Love, he turned out to be a pretty good film. And Mitchum was like a mentor. It was great. Right after the Ramos fight in uh, 69 in 1970, at the very beginning in January, you fought uh, who's, uh, you know, a big icon in boxing today, which is George Foreman. George Foreman. Uh, He was only 14. No one would fight. After I beat Ramos, no one wanted to fight me. He was only 14-0 at that time. You know, what what do you remember about about that fight with George Foreman there in Madison Square Garden? Well, I only trained a week for the fight. That was the worst part. I trained a week for the fight. You can watch it. It's on YouTube, actually. I just saw week. the highlights today, yes. I trained a week for the fight, and I was actually beaten in the first couple of rounds, and I walked into a punch, and I got up. That's what really made me mad. I was up on they stopped the fight right away. Right away, they, they stopped it. And so it's my own fault. I walked into a punch. George could punch. I walked into a punch, and I went down, and I got up, and uh, and they stopped the fight, and I was good. And he would never fight me again. The crazy thing, George Jack. and I became very good friends. The crazy thing about that, Jack, is that like when I saw that those highlights are earlier today. I mean, you made him look like regular. You know what I mean? He was—they call him Big George Foreman, no, no. and you made him look like like he was a regular guy. What, what did you think of him? Like walking into that ring, did you see anything different than all your other opponents? Or no, I just I, the problem was I knew I knew I didn't train as, as well as I should have because George trained his ass off. And <laughs> anyway, is it? It was an error on my part, and it was what it was, you know. And it just, uh, but he would never fight me again. It was, uh, it's like when I when I fought Alvin Blue Lewis in Detroit. And at first, I, I went down to. Uh, they called me on the phone from Houston. They wanted me to lose Scusi. Wanted me to fight Terry Daniels, because they were looking to make a Frazier fight with a white guy, and. And Terry Daniels was a ranked fighter, and he was up and coming and all that jazz. And, and I had been training at home because I had some union problems, and I couldn't get out on the street, so I was in the gym every day. And when I got down to, to Houston, Ms. Cousy said, my God, kid, you're really in good shape. I said, that's right, puppy. And I destroyed Terry Daniels. They should have stopped the fight in the first round, but he was a tough kid. I knocked him out, I think it was the third or fourth round. And flying back to Philly on the plane, Yank Dorham was on the plane. And he looked at me and he said, Jack, you fight one more good fighter and you can have the Frazier fight in the Houston Astrodome. I said, I'll tell you what, you name the fighter and the place and send me a ticket. He said, are you kidding me? I said, you know what I said? You name the fighter and the place, just send me a ticket. <laughs> so they called me a couple of weeks later and they said, you're fighting Cleveland Williams in Houston, Texas, which is Cleveland's hometown. And I went down to Houston and I beat Cleveland 10 out of 10. We'll Actually, get, the last three three and, rounds, I was holding him up. And we'll but I'll get, tell you one thing. He hit me harder than anybody. I was going to tell you. Thank God I was in shape. Well, we'll get to that fight in a bit. You So you fight Manuel Ramos. Then you fight George Foreman right after him. And your very next fight is uh, Mac Foster. And, uh, you know, he was 23-0. and And you fought him there at the Olympic Auditorium in, in Los Angeles, which is like the yeah, Madison, I, which I, is like Madison yeah. Square Garden. Well, what do you remember? I'll tell you something about that fight. Yeah, yeah, please. He, uh, his corner was, he, he had a guy from, I think, Chicago, Cleveland. They uh, put something in my water bottle. And I know that because I, uh, I was not, something was wrong. And I, was in, I wasn't in bad shape when I went. And, and Mac Foster, and they would never fight because I was, I, Mac Foster was not a bad fighter, but he wasn't a great fighter. But he was a southpaw. And, and I didn't know that until I got in the ring. But uh, I walked into a punch where they, I just wasn't right. Something was wrong. And I went and had a test done the next day, and something was put into a bottle. So I never said nothing about it. It was just part of, that's part of the game. But the people that worked his corner paid for it. Trust me. Well, when I fought Norton in, in 72, um, they, we, again, I was we were having union problems, and I, so I was off. This, I was at home, locked up at home. So 
so I wouldn't get in too much trouble on the street. So I, they called me up to fight Kenny Norton. And I said, when? They said, next week. I said, send me a ticket. They said, you'll take the fight? And I said, send me a ticket because I wanted to get out of New Jersey. And I went to California and uh, trained four days for the fight. And Norton and I had a war. And I, I beat him up actually pretty bad. In the ninth round, the, the people were standing on the chair screaming so loud that they couldn't hear the bell ring. So they rang it four times, and they finally, the referee separated us. And I was going back to my corner, and he ran across the ring behind the head and drove me into the ring post. And the commissioner, Joe Almas, was sitting in the corner, in my corner. He jumped up in my corner and said, you can't continue. You just won the fight on foul. And I said, foul, I'm going to kill this guy. And I should have listened to the Mexican wow. trainer there because – I was boxing in his hometown. He was owned by multi-millionaires. They were looking for the L.A. fight. So he got a hometown decision, the boy, and he knew it too. And he, uh, so, but I won the town and I stayed there and I knocked out a half dozen people and uh, won the California heavyweight title. But before that, uh, you brought up uh, the the fight with the Cleveland Williams uh, there in Houston. Uh, That was a big fight for you. You won it. What do you remember about that fight with uh, Cleveland Williams, you know, big time? Uh, he hit fighter. me in the second round. He hit me harder than anybody ever hit me. I, I mean, I felt it in my toe. <laughs> he hit me so hard. <laughs> and he could punch. He was a hell of a punch. But he he caught me a left hook, and, and I, I fell back into the corner, and he came charging at me. So I thumbed him and spun him, cuffed him and spun him around, and I whispered in his ear, and never touched me the rest of the night, old man. And I gave him a boxing lesson. And then the last three rounds of the fight, I kept holding him up. I hit him a combination. He was falling down. I grabbed him under the arm. I said, don't be falling down on me, man. We've been dancing all night. But did, he was a pretty good guy. And if, and if I'd have knocked him out, it would have hurt his earning capacity. So we went the distance, and I beat him easy. Would you say he hit harder than uh, Foreman? Yeah. We're, we're talking about all these like big-time fighters that you fought that you fought Ron uh, Standard. Ron Standard. Uh, uh, Ron Standard uh, told that. everybody he he knew he knew I beat him. <laughs> yeah. That was a real Omaha decision. And after Cleveland, I mean, Williams, they only trained three days for the fight, but yeah. I beat him up pretty bad. And they still show his fights. Ronnie, like, Ronnie, Ronnie, was, Ronnie was a dear friend of mine. He just died, actually. Yeah, yeah. He, uh, Ronnie, I mean, Ronnie they, was a very good friend of mine. They still show his fights on ESPN. And then right after uh, Cleveland Williams, he fought Ron Lyle, another big fighter. Uh, there in Denver, you know what do you remember about that fight with uh, Ron Lyle? Oh, that was Ronnie was a good kid, I, and I really walked into a punch. And that was another one they stopped right away because I jumped right up while I was madder than hell. He hit me behind the ear. You know, I, I was ducking away from something, and he he caught me behind the back of the head, and and it, and I fell. I went down, but I got right back up, and they stopped the fight right away because they wanted him to fight for the title. He was owned by some pretty serious people from from uh, Denver. They got him out of jail to create, you know, to groom to fight for the title. Now Ronnie was a good kid, you know. They got it. They they groomed him, and in fact, he wound up uh, helping me with Frankie Lyles out in Vegas. And you talked about uh, Ken Norton, who who you fought about a couple months later after that, and then yeah. uh, down the line you fought. Uh, Raman Ali, who was the brother of Muhammad Ali, oh, geez, and, you, and, you, and oh. you retired him pretty much. It was, was what they call him when the, when you're you're their last <laughs> fight. Called um, Muhammad you, called me on the phone. <laughs> Ali called me on the phone. What do you he remember said, about that fight you, with you, the Raman? You, you Ali called me up on the phone. He said, "You got to do me a favor." And I said, "Yeah, I'll do you a favor." I said, "Sign the damn contract to fight." He said, "No, no, no. We'll get to that. But you really got to do me a favor." And I said, "What favor?" He said, you're fighting my brother, Rockman. You got to get him out of boxing. I said, what are you talking <laughs> no, about? No, are you I serious? I said, Rockman Ali's your brother. Yeah, this is. I said, Rockman Ali's your brother? He said, yeah, Rockman's my brother, and you got to help him. You got to get him out of boxing. So I said, oh, my God, I've only go in the gym a couple of days. I, so I went in the gym, and, and I knocked him out in the ninth, I think the ninth round, and he never fought again. I mean, I hurt him bad. I, I felt bad. I went back to the dress. His mother was a ringside. <laughs> Jumping up and down, so I went back to the dressing room to see him to make sure he was okay. Because Ali and I were pretty good friends. Right. And I went back to see him and I said, "Are you okay, kid? How you feel?" He said, "My God, you hit hard." I said, "God, <laughs> what the hell do you know about God? You're a Muslim." <laughs> I said, "That must have hit you pretty damn hard, man." Huh? <laughs> and he was a. Uh, 
it, well, was he was he a good fighter? Was he like uh No, he wasn't a bad fighter. You know, but he, he moved. He ran. And then he clinched with you and he'd run, you know, and and we were and we were going we were, it was the eighth round, my trainer said to me, Jack, you gotta knock this kid out or they're gonna steal the title. That's Ali's brother. They're gonna steal the fight. They're gonna give him a decision if you don't do something. And I said, Don't worry about it. I went out in the ninth round and stuck my chin out. He would push him against the rope, stuck my chin out, and he came up. Thought he was coming up with a with a with a with a right hand. He was going to hit me on the chin. I slipped that, and hit him with an uppercut, and picked him right up off the ground. And then I came back with a left hook. He was already on the floor. Wow, <laughs> was, good stuff. You know, uh, Jimmy Somerville, you know, in uh, in Miami, there you fought Florida. him. Oh and, my god! Was, uh, and, and they and I heard that before uh, this fight or around this time. There was a chance he was going to fight Ali. Yeah, um, he and I were, were supposed to fight again, and then I went. And I'm down talking to about Florida Muhammad and, Ali, not Rahman Ali, but Muhammad Ali. No, I know. Yeah, <laughs> Muhammad. Four times we were supposed to fight. And what what and happened was, there? Uh, what what exactly happened there? The Somerville fight was was kind of a weird deal, and they stopped it. Really, they were trying to build him up for a fight, you know, and they they stopped the first fight. And I said, "This is bullshit. I want this fight. This kid right away." I turned around for him, I think a month later, and knocked him out. I think I knocked him out. Beat him. I know it beat him pretty good. I think they stopped the fight in the ninth round or seventh, eighth round, something like that. You lost him in the first one, and that it supposedly like messed up the, your your uh, fight with Ali, but then you beat him again in the rematch, right? Oh, I went. I turned right around. I wanted to fight him right away, and I did. It beat him easy. Punched how, the shit out of him. And, I was really pissed <laughs> off. and how come you didn't get that fight with Ali after you beat him? Or rematch him? Well, because he he went and fought uh, Bugner. Uh, no, he fought the uh, yeah. I think it was Bugner down in Australia. He was supposed he and I were supposed to fight, and I think Bugner fought him in Australia, which kind of pissed me off. We were four times we were supposed to fight. Then I I fought a guy Alvin Blue Lewis, who had just went thirteen rounds with Ali in Ireland. And he came home, and he beat Terrell, and he beat another guy, and they were getting ready to make another title fight with him and Muhammad Ali. And they called me on the phone, and they had just taken my license in California because of organized crime, which was a bunch of bullshit, but they did. And they called me on the phone to fight uh, Alvin Blue Lewis in Michigan. He was supposed to fight Buster Mathis, and Mathis couldn't get a license. So when they called me, and the promoter called me, and I said, can I get a license? He said, absolutely. I said, good, send me a ticket. He said, you'll take the fight? I said, absolutely. I went up to Detroit, and uh, I beat Blue Lewis so bad. <laughs> when I tell you bad, I broke his ribs. I broke his elbow. I, I mean, I punched him. I stopped hitting him in the head after the eighth round because I busted him up so bad, and I wanted to go to the distance with him. I wanted to, I wanted to beat him 10 out of 10. But I had somebody bet in the fight at the ringside, you know? A friend of mine was Ronnie Harris was betting every way. He said, Jack, you're in Detroit. You're in his hometown. This guy just went with Ali. And you want to, and you think, I said, bet every single round. I'm going to beat this guy to death. And I did. In fact, I beat him so bad that every time he, anybody mentioned my name, he hit him under the dashboard of the car. <laughs> and, uh, 1974, you made your last fight there uh, against Howard uh, Smith there in San Diego. Why did you decide to hang him up there, you know, after that fight? Well, I, first of all, when I fought Howard Smith, who was a good friend of mine, I, 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 they had me locked up in jail. I come out of jail for two days before the fight. They let me out for the fight, so I didn't train at all. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that the acromegaly was getting to me, and I knew I was getting it fixed. And, um, it was just time. That's all. It was time. Are you satisfied with your, your with your boxing career? Like looking back at it. Well, you know, I did, did, there's there's some fights that were never registered on my on my record because they when I boxed up in Boston, and there were two promoters up there, Subway Sam Silverman and and his partner, and they used to have fights everywhere, in Maine and Bangor, Maine, and Ford. So every week they had a fight somewhere, like club fights, you know? So it was, you know, fighters used to travel around and watch the fights and all that stuff, and I'd go in and they'd say, Jack, do you have your boxing shoes with you? I said, well, for what? Well, we're short about. And uh, I said, I can't take a fine management. 
I was I was fighting pretty good at the time. And I said, I, I can't. Uh, they said, no, we'll, we'll put you under another name. Don't worry about it. So I had like 20 fights. I got all knockouts. I never put them on my record. Oh, it was wow. like a gym workout, you know? How was it that you got started in uh, films right after your your boxing career? You know how how did that how did that happen? It's right away. They they called me up to do Farewell, My Lovely with Robert Mitchum, and it was a leading role. And it was great. And, um, and I'll tell you a funny story. You know, when I did Farewell, My Lovely, Stallone did a bit part in the movie, and he was writing the Rocky script, and he picked my brain every day because. I was the gangster fighter in Philadelphia. Yeah. Oh, wow. And and I and he picked my brain about the waterfront, about this, about that. So the Rocky story was really my own your life, story. You know yeah, I mean? that's right. He's from Philadelphia. I didn't even think about that. He was really never from Philly. Yeah. Well, was, of course not. Yeah. 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 But I mean, his character so was he, supposed to be. You know, uh, Rocky was supposed to be yeah, from yeah. Philadelphia, and that's yeah, where yeah. you're and from. The waterfront collecting. Yeah. And I, and I was when I. Worked with the teamsters and stuff down in the waterfront and all that shit. And he, you know, I, and I told him a lot of stories about Hoffa and everything else. He, he incorporated all this stuff in, in the gym that he, he had him living in South Philadelphia, but the gym, they, they made it like it was in North Philadelphia, but it wasn't. It was the same exact building at Pashyunk and Moore where we all trained at. I would do Ardello, myself, a bunch of fighters. It was way up the third floor and crickety old steps up there. It was a, so it was made me laugh because I described all that to him. Did you have to take like like acting classes and all that, or did they like tell you, hey, you don't? No, know. Robert Mitchum was my acting coach. No, nope. Robert Mitchum was my mentor. Super no, I never took an acting. Class. Superman was released in 1978. You shared a scene there with, uh, you know, what everybody calls the best actor of all time, Marlon Brando. What do you remember Brandon, about what do you remember about doing that scene with uh, Marlon Brando? Fernando and I became very good friends because he knew my father, in New York, wow. and we became really good friends. And he, uh, I, I like Marlon quite a bit, and he was a brilliant. I mean, you're talking about one of the elite actors of Hollywood. Well, so, I mean, working with Brando was a trip, it's like well, working with Mitch. You know. I bet, but I mean, you know, like your dad was an elite, you know, mobster as as well, and he played the Godfather. So, you know, like, what? how did that play out? I mean, did you, did he know that, who you were, or how you were related to? Oh, yeah. To? No, no, no. We, we, we had great conversation. We had great conversation. He knew who I was. Did, did he know your when father personally? Yeah. Oh, no way. Yeah. Oh, wow. We did the picture on the waterfront. Did the picture on the waterfront, and, and the guy running the docks was my uncle, Tony, Tony Anastasia. Oh, wow. That is crazy. What was the scene that you enjoyed the most from making those those uh, S- uh, Superman movies? You know, what, what were the, the the scenes that you you enjoyed the most? I you know we did some being able you know when they came to me to do Superman and they told me that they, because the character that I did was a brilliant scientist that they lobotomized because he was hanging around with Zod, so as his punishment he was lobotomized, and they said, "How do you feel about playing?" A, a, you know, deaf, dumb, mute like guy, you know, not deaf, but like a mute. And I said, I embrace it because uh, Jackie G- Jackie Gleason was a friend of mine. and He did a picture called Gigo and he won an Oscar for it playing a deaf, dumb, mute. And so I said, you know, the opportunity to be able to do facial and body expression as an actor, I, I, I found that and the character was just right because General Zai was a brilliant, was a vicious general. Sarah was a man eater, so somebody had to relate to the kids because it was a child, you know, audience movie. So I played this brutish guy like a child, learning how to work his eyes and, and doing, you know, crazy things like taking and ripping the, the red thick globe off and handing it to Zod like, you know, I was always looking for approvals, you know, and then burning the hole in the side of the truck in front of the kid uh, and getting all jubilant about it. So I, I, I just did it. it worked very well. Played the played the non like a child, and it appeared to work really well. Absolutely, Did you enjoy the film. Absolutely, and I think it brought the like the kids, um, you know that that watch that film like like myself, you know, thinking back at that movie when you know I was a kid myself when I watched that for the first time, but it, it, it made you feel like 
this guy, like, I can relate to this, to this character, even though he's a bad guy and I shouldn't be related to him, but I can relate to him. You know what I mean? Cause he well, was, he they, was childlike. He was childlike. Yeah. No, that's what they, I mean, I remember going to my first Comic Con and somebody came up to me and they started talking to me. They said, Oh my God, you can actually speak. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, and the guy said to me, he said, he said, you know, you, your character scared the shit out of me, but I love your character. <laughs> Uh, a lot of people said that to me, you know, and then your character was, wow, you scared out of me, but I love the character. Because it was like a child, you know? Absolutely. A so evidently, mo- evidently, it did it well. A few months back, I watched uh, Superman 2 uh, for the first time in a long time, and I realized how big the soles of your shoes were. And especially in that scene where, you know, you pick up the, the police car and, you know, uh, mm. uh, you know, scare those guys. Was it hard to walk in those like big shoes? I know I'm sure they tried to make. Nah, you... it wasn't. No, it wasn't too bad. It wasn't too bad. <laughs> it was. Uh, they, it was uh, no, it wasn't too bad. No, it was. Uh, it was they, they wanted me to look like I was a giant. You know. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, as it is, you it were a good. giant, but you know, uh, they, they yeah, they tried to make you look. But it worked out than... really. Worked Sarah was tall, and Terrence wasn't that short. Terrence was about six foot, so. It, was, it worked out well. And Terrence is one of the brilliant English actors. And Sarah's developed into a hell of an actress. Oh, absolutely. So uh, it all some, worked out pretty well. Somebody asked me to ask you, what was it like working with Christopher Reed? Christopher was a, a very naive young kid. It was the first big movie he ever had. And, and it wasn't for Richard Donner. I mean, there'll never be another Superman like Christopher. He did Clark Kent, Superman, terrific. And Donner, Richard Donner did that. When he came on the set to be to hired for this thing, he was a 172-pound weakling. And they took him, and the, the guy that did Darth Vader was a bodybuilder. And I said, man, you don't want to pump him up too big. You want to trim him down like Steve Reeves, who was a Mr. America, and cut really defined well. I said, you want to just define him because he won't wear anything under that costume, so you want to make him look really real. Oh God! What the hell was his name? Shit! I, nice I, guy. I, I, I don't know the name of that. Guy. Okay. But he uh, he was a bodybuilder, and and they they hired him to to build to, you know, to work with Chris. And I had a chat with him, and I said, "This is what you want to do with him," and he agreed. And he, he he put twenty pounds of muscle on him, and and he it turned out really well. But Richard Donner, have you ever seen the Donner cut? You know what? I I didn't until about three years ago, oh, you, and I love that yeah. more than the. I oh, mean, much I, better. Put, much put, put, better. Put it this way: I, I'm like one of my favorite movies that I remember of all time is Superman two, and mm. the, and I love the original. When I saw the the uh, Donner the, the, cut, the, the Donner cut, it hurt me because it was like like it tore up my my childhood movie. But at the same time, it made it better. You know what I mean? So it, well, it was. Kind of, it was a better film. It was a better film. What did you think of that change? Or well, it was, it was sad. It was bullshit. It was, they, they owed, the saw kinds were cheaper than shit. And they owed Richard Lester a picture. And they didn't want to pay Donner. And Donner, if, if Donner would have done Superman 2, finished it the way he wanted to, he would have done 3, 4, 5, and 6. It would have been a whole different franchise. And I blame Christopher. Christopher should have stood up and said, no Donner, no me. He goes, Donner made his career, you know. But he should have stood up and said, no Richard Donner, no me. But he was too naive and young. And they filled his head with a bunch of shit, and they paid him a lot of money. So, I I mean, I almost didn't go back. I, Gene Hackman didn't go back. But the Lester cut had comedy in it. And, and Mr. Lester, I mean, Donner had already shot 86% of the movie. That's why the Donner cut was available. The tip for him to add things that were that were uh, screen tests and stuff and throw it out. But it was 26 years later that Donna Cut came out, and Warner's made a fortune with it. It was a different film. It was the same movie without the comedy. And Richard Lester, for him to put his name as a director, he had to shoot better than 50% of the movie. So he went back and reshot stuff. You know what I mean? And it was a big difference because, like, how uh, the mirror that you guys were, like, up, you know, like, uh, you know, in outer space stuck in, how how that disintegrated and how you guys came about. And also, um, uh, well, it's the Lois same Lane, as they fired Brando. How, how Lois Lane shot. You didn't Lane see Brando and didn't. That's right. In Superman 2, you didn't That's see right. Brando. And, and then but how, he's in the Donner Cut. 
Yeah, how Lois Lane shot uh, Superman, and, and that's how she found out. Yeah, um, fire, yeah. sticking his hand in yeah. the fire in the bridal suite. Exactly, yeah, totally <laughs> different. Uh, today we see all these DC and Marvel comic movies, and they're like the biggest and most popular movies that people are waiting for. The Superman movie started all this, and you're a part of oh, it. Oh, started it all. And yeah, you're, no, you're, it was, you're uh, a part of it. it so well, what do you think about that, man, that you're a part of this revolutionary history, you know, making thing that is going to go off oh, forever, yeah, even yeah, after yeah, you yeah. and I? What do you think about being It'll that, be, being it, a part of that? It made us, an iconic, it made us iconic actors. Absolutely. You know? And so what we're doing now is we're, I have wrote a great treatment to do to bring Christopher back on the screen and the three villains. And we have a great treatment and and we're we're pitching it at Warner Brothers right now. And I think we're gonna get it done. Oh, I hope so. And it'll you know what it'll do is see what I don't like about the super villain movies they do now, these guys kill more people than the bad guys. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's too much violence. And so we're gonna take it back in another way. The villains, the three of us in jail there's another planet, and it's a sister planet, and they, they have a technology that reverses our mind thinking, and they reverse my lobotomy. And the first words I say is, Zod, kneel before Nan. <laughs> oh, wow. You're good, huh? <laughs> yeah. And, and, they, and they make us go from bad guys to good guys, and we become cohorts of Superman. So he's got like a little army right now. You understand? And all these people come from different planets, Instead of killing them, we have a technology that we reverse their thinking pattern. Like from our era, you know, like when I used to watch Superman back in, you know, like when you you made those movies, there was a good guy and bad guy. And that's all it was. Even like professional wrestling, I used to love professional wrestling. There was the good guys and the bad guys. You go for the good guys, you boo the bad guys. Today, it's a totally different audience. Like people yeah. actually love the bad guys. Wild. You know, they Too love the bad wrong. guys and they root for the bad guys. We put Christopher back on the screen. Right. People will go nuts. The fan audience, the fan base will go crazy. Cause Cause he, was, he was a great Superman. What do you think of the of the new Superman movies that have come out afterwards? I'm sure. Well, probably... they got darker and darker. They got darker and darker, didn't they? Yeah, they did. And it's not in a I good mean, way. Superman it's not, in, it's not in a good way either. It's not in a no. good way. Even, no. with, even with all the no. technology, it's not in a good way. You know what I mean? No. The technology that we had set the premise for it. We did not use CGI. Yeah. We shot Vista Vision on Vista Vision. Exactly. That's why the, the Superman movies stand up today better than anything. If you got hurt, you got hurt. That's, you know, that's the way it was. That's why the Donner Cut, the Donner Cut is great. Yeah. I, mean, I, I, I always say to people, you ever watch the Donner Cut? If you like Superman too. Go watch the Donner the Cut. The Donner Cut, yeah. I was looking at your uh, IMDB uh, page. I saw that you were on Hunter, and I saw that you were on Murder, She Wrote. And I had that on some of my apps, so I saw the two episodes. Hunter, you played a, uh, a guy that was in jail with Hunter while he was uh, yeah. in there. Hey. And then in the in uh, Murder, She Wrote, you played like the associate of, of a guy that was like a mobster in that. Um, mm. Those two roles, you actually... Got physical on those. How yeah, easy were those roles for you, or or hard? Very easy. They weren't. They weren't hard at all. Uh, what was it like being a lot in, of fun doing it? Actually. Really, what was it like being in those roles, or, or even getting asked to be in those roles to shoot them with all those uh, great actors of the of that time? Well, I really didn't like television because I thought it was a cheat on people, you know. Uh, but I, the, the actors that were in the, the things they asked me to do. I did because of them. You know, she, Angela was a great person to work with. Uh, Fred Fred Dreyer played ball. I knew Fred as a football player, and he was again he was a good actor, and it was a good series. So I said, yeah. Same as the I did the uh, uh, Perry Mason. And the very first one I ever did television wise was Cannon, and I did that because Mitchum was friends with Bob Conroy. Conrad, and he said, do the show. And I said, okay. You authored a book about a dozen years ago called Family Legacy. Family right, Legacy the- is going to be a great movie. We were we were going to just do a miniseries, but we have decided to do uh, two films, a movie and a sequel, and then do really? then go into the series. Because I'm writing two more books. Oh, so wow. It's gonna, and it's a lot of truth we're telling. So it's going to be quite exciting. 
And why why should people, people love it? Why should people like watch it or or read it or or learn about it? Because I know well, it's a lot of truth. Let me ask you a question: If you read the God, if you like the Godfather, you're going to love Family Legacy. Yeah, absolutely. If you like the Godfather, it, the Family Legacy is going to be real. A lot of truth. How hard is it for you to do it to like sit down there and just like be writing about this? stuff that no it's it's time that people who are told the truth people have been you know some of the like the the books a five-star book on amazon and right. and and some of the reviews there's one old man from new york he was like 90 years old and he loved he said i he said i love this because he said i lived it and i know that better than 80 percent of the book is true because i was there and finally somebody's writing the truth so it's going to be uh interesting does it put you into trouble though doing this? Like writing about uh, this? No. 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 <laughs> what do you think of boxing today? Do you still watch it? Are you still around it? Oh, uh, you know, they, they don't fight enough. I mean these guys <laughs> fight once a year or once every two years. That's yeah. that's a bunch of shit. And they get paid. <laughs> yeah. When I started boxing when I started boxing I got ten dollars a round. Yeah. But I was on salary, so it, it was okay. But yeah. the, my purses were nothing. I mean, you gave it to the trainer. <laughs> you got ten dollars around, you know. Absolutely. For for fights until you got you know you worked your way up, but you never really made. Ali was the one that brought money into boxing. And on nobody top, made money until Ali. On top of that, like a lot of people, like now when they lose and they lose a fight, they can't fight for like six months. It's just mandatory. And back then, you know, shoot, six months, they could fight five more and times. I was fighting. Yeah, you know I, I, mean? I was fighting. Are you kidding? Yeah, exactly. I, 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 was fighting. I, I, I know where lot, you're going. I had a lot of fights in nine years. Yeah, I know where you're going. Yeah. The different, and, there, and I'll tell you, when I was boxing, yeah, there were 20 guys, heavyweights, that could have been champion today. Oh, Zora that's Foley, Cleveland Williams. There were some tough fighters. Yeah. There were oh. guys that could fight. Yeah, Cleveland Williams alone. That's why when I saw that you beat him, I was like, "Oh Cleveland shit!" Williams, Cleveland Williams, you had, you had Zora Foley, and I thought I could go down a list. Zora Foley, guys that yeah, couldn't. Zora Foley was a tough guy. He was a tough. The whole of a fight, fight. Well, thank you very much, Jack. Thank you for coming on and you know reviewing your whole uh, boxing hey, career here my with pleasure. us. My pleasure. <laughs> and it was awesome talk, talking to you, and uh, not just as a Superman fan, but as a boxing fan, and obviously my. My site's about boxing, and, and uh, I love to hear stories like yours, man. Thank you very much, man, for being here. Thank you very much. My for pleasure. Being, thank you for very much for being yourself. My thank pleasure, you. for sure.